Well, a very good morning, everyone, Secretary of State, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I am John Parker, the President of the Royal Academy of Engineering, and I'm very delighted to welcome you all here to Prince Philip House or the Engineering Forum as we know it. This is a fitting setting, I believe, in which to launch this very important new foresight report on the future of manufacturing. And as the UK's National Academy of Engineering, we know just how important manufacturing is to the economy and we work to promote its success. The UK is a technocratic nation with tremendous companies competing on a world stage. We have some of the best products and the most innovative business models in the world, but capturing value in a modern Globalised setting means understanding and navigating the increasingly complex industrial system in which many of our manufacturing industries operate. In 2012, this academy undertook work to identify and characterise that industrial system and how to capture value within it. And we recognise the need for government to work with industry to identify, to marshal, and deploy the technologies, assets and capabilities we need for success. So this foresight initiative with its many partners from across industry and academia working with BIS has been very timely and very welcome. The report provides a sharp and compelling analysis of the challenges and opportunities that we face. It is a good read. But what I also find uh, as a very important message within it is the recognition that government policies need to be aligned and targeted to under underpin our drive for industrial and manufacturing growth. Secretary of State, I'm sure I speak for many in this room when I say how much I value the work you have championed to create a modern industrial strategy for the UK. And as part of that, your commitment to equipping the UK with the right engineering skills for the future sends a strong signal that government understands where the growth will come from. I happen to believe personally that these signals from government are also of extreme importance to families and schools when considering future career choices. The report that is being launched today sets us on the right path to turning that vision into a reality. Thank you, sir. I now hand over to Sir Mark Walpole. Thank you very much indeed. And I just want to say a couple of thank yous first. So this report was initiated by my predecessor, Sir John Bellington, and I very much came in at the end. So it's to him um, that any um, uh, thanks is really due. Um, I want to thank Sandy Thomas and her team in Foresight for all the work they put into it. And I particularly want to thank uh, Richard Lapthorne, who will speak shortly, uh, for chairing the lead expert group and all the members of the lead expert group for all the work that they've put into this important report. Um, there are basically three straightforward key messages of the report. So I'm going to give you sort of three elevator pitches. They're quite tall elevators, but never mind. Um, the first key message is that manufacturing matters, and this, I think, is not going to be something that this audience needs a lot of persuasion about. Um, the absolute contribution is 10% to the GDP, um, but it's extremely important for our exports. So 53% of UK exports in 2012 came from the manufacturing industry. Um, it's an R&D intensive part of our activity, so about 75% of total UK business R&D spend between 2000 and 2011 came from manufacturing companies. Um, the growth has been good in manufacturing, um, and it provides highly skilled and well-paid jobs. Um, and a diverse manufacturing industry provides resilience in the face of recession. So I don't think anyone here will argue that manufacturing, firstly, currently is, but secondly, it must continue to be an essential part of the UK economy. I think that's absolutely non-contentious. However, there are some challenges, and 
Um, the, this is the United Kingdom curve. So this is the manufacturing as the share of total GDP. And you can see that it has fallen in the United Kingdom between 1990 and 2010. And the challenge now is to uh, have an inflection in this and move it in the other direction. So the second key message is that the world of manufacturing is changing. And the old view of manufacturing, which, which is that a widget of some kind is produced from a factory, it leaves it, and that's the end of it, um, is no longer the case. And so it's about packaging of services with products. Um, so for example, the in-flight information that you get from a Trent engine as it travels around the world. Um, it's about selling technological know-how, the chip design of ARM. And it's about actually making sure that products last longer, so remanufacturing them, the sort of thing that JCB and Caterpillar do. And so the value chain around manufacturing is much broader, uh, but it's not clear that current metrics capture the whole of that value chain. Um, again, as we move to IT embedded in products, um, we're going to start seeing mass personalization of products on demand. And we're going to begin to see a whole range of different environments in which manufacturing occurs. So there will still be the classic big, now very high-tech, robotic um, uh, manufacturing facilities, but we're going to see modular manufacturing facilities, and the pharma industry is beginning to move in that direction. We're beginning to see the prospect of manufacturing actually happening uh, directly for the end consumer with additive manufacturing at home potentially and we're going to see mobile manufacturing. Um, much greater design freedom and flexibility and design being a key part of that value chain and as I've already implied much more in the way of digital connection along the value chain. Um, there are clearly new demographic, new market opportunities so we have the demography of aging populations around the world uh, we have the rapidly changing shape of the global economy with the enormous importance of India, China, Brazil, Russia, and a whole series of other countries developing very fast indeed. Uh, we're seeing globalization of manufacturing, so the whole value chain being fragmented across the globe potentially. But we're also seeing onshoring. So it's not a question of pile it high, sell it cheap, manufacture it cheaply. It's actually doing it in the best possible place and some of that involves onshoring back to the UK. Um, and of course, uh, with all of the changes in the natural environment, um, there's the issue of sustainability for manufacturing going forward. So how do we deal with shortages of water, with other mineral resources? We're going to have to be much more frugal in the way that we use our natural resources. And of course, there's also the challenge that we face in terms of volatility in the price of commodities, and we've seen that dramatically uh, in terms of food. Um, and again, increasingly, as we look to more sustainable uh, consumption of our natural resources, then the reuse, the remanufacturing, the recycling of products is going to become ever more important. And of course, we're going to depend on skilled workers. Um, and the number of jobs in manufacturing, of course, has fallen very dramatically since the 1960s. There are now something under 3 million workers involved in manufacturing, but that has probably now plateaued, and with retirements, there'll probably be a need for about 800,000 new people in manufacturing industries, and that creates a very important skills agenda, and the people we need in the future will have different qualifications from the people that have needed in the past. And I think one of the key messages is the importance of STEM, of science, technology, <coughs> engineering, mathematics skills in education, because this has actually got to start with enthusing youngest people. And I must say, part of the privilege of my job is going around and seeing manufacturing facilities around the country and internationally. And once you've visited a few of these places, I can't see why everyone doesn't want to work in uh, manufacturing. Um, um, and um, uh, the potential for human enhancement, let's not go too far down that route today. Um, <laughs> So the third key message is what are the policy implications of this future world of manufacturing? Um, and the first I've already signaled, which is actually we need to have better metrics to actually be able to assess what is happening with manufacturing. So it's about beyond measuring output, it's about capturing that whole value chain because it may be contributing much more to our GDP once you look at that extended chain. Um, it's then about policy instruments, it's about targeting the support recognizing that a lot of the policy issues around manufacturing cross a number of government departments. 
um, is about enhancing capability, and the Foresight Report draws attention to the US and the Australian offices of manufacturing. And of course, in the UK, we've set up Infrastructure UK as a way of coordinating infrastructure decision-making across government. And it's about building on successful existing initiatives, so for example, the catapults. So that's a very short, high-level elevator pitch, as it were, from me. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to the Secretary of State, uh, the Right Honourable Vince Cable. Vince. Well, can I thank you for inviting me and um, very much welcome this report, which is a you know, big addition to uh, long-term thinking uh, and in, in relation to public policy. Um, Sir so John, in his introduction of me, mentioned... Uh, the idea of the industrial strategy that we're trying to develop in government. And it has two core ideas at its heart, one of which is public and private sector working together rather than pulling in opposite directions. Uh, and the other is the need for long-term strategic thinking that goes beyond one parliament. Uh, you see what happens uh, where there are areas of policy. We're currently seeing it in energy and airports where politicians can't agree and don't have a long-term perspective and nothing happens. But I think in industrial strategy we've got beyond that uh, and it's very important that we cement that understanding because public policy cycles uh, have got to match uh, long-term strategy for business. I came out, as many of you know, of the oil and gas industry. Um, one of my jobs was uh, working with the long-term planning team, scenario planning. Uh, we used to have a 20, 25 year time horizon and used to rather look down on governments that, you know, at best operated on five years, often at worst on weeks, as in the United States and arguably Germany at the moment. Uh, but, you know, what the challenge you've set yourself with this project isn't actually 20, 25, I think it's 35 years. Well, that's, that's brave, but it, it, it hits the right message, which is about the importance of long term thinking and it's also. International, you've drawn on the ideas of 25 countries, uh, and it raises some very, very important questions which I now want to address with you. I think the, the key point which Sir Mark has just emphasized is the importance of uh, manufacturing. I've just come from, uh, the reason I'm a bit late is I've just come from a, a, a session with the uh, automotive industry and parliamentarians, big success story. Um, in a way, it's easier to talk about manufacturing in terms of wings and wheels. People understand these things. Whereas, in many ways, what we're talking about here today is a little bit intangible. But it is important at that slightly more abstract level to explain why manufacturing matters. And I think I'll just make two points about it. The first is that simply, in, in, in simple static terms, we're talking about over half of British exports, certainly exports of goods, uh, we're talking about you know, a, the, the bulk of British R&D, not just a, a share of it, the substantial majority of R&D comes through the manufacturing sector. Uh, and perhaps more subtle but more important, it is probably the only sector, possibly transport and communications as well, which can drive growth right across the economy because of its supply chain linkages. Uh, and if we're going to be a productive growing economy, uh, we have to have a healthy and successful manufacturing sector. And that's why this discussion and this report are so important. Now, what I picked out of it were several key points, and it's probably worth summarizing them. I think the first is that there is more to manufacturing than just making things, making products. Uh, the evidence suggests from our top companies 100 plus employee companies that currently something of the order of 40% of them have a very, very substantial amount of their profit derived from service related activities. In other words, the overlap between manufacturing and services is now so extreme that it isn't possible to identify a manufacturing company in any very simple way. Moreover, the nature of processes is changing in a very radical way so that the old-fashioned idea of a factory located in one place with a settled labor force, mass manufacturing large numbers of units is gradually breaking down. And we're heading towards a report where uh, we have mass personalization, 
of low-cost products based on new materials, 3D printing and computer tools and in which factories are flexible and mobile. Difficult idea, I think, probably for people to get their head around, but that will increasingly be the way it is. Secondly, the importance of looking at this in global terms, uh, and particularly at the big shift in the center of gravity of the world economy. One of the big exercises which I led in Shell in the early 1990s was um, in trying to get the help the Shell group to get its head round the idea of what we called a new frontiers world in which the developed countries grew by 2% a year and the new emerging economies, which by then included the former Soviet Union, uh, would grow by 6% plus. And the point of it was compound interest. You know, starting back in 1990 and compounding those differential growth rates, you got an enormously changed world 20 years ahead, which is where we are now. Uh, and that world has happened. Actually, it's probably been way been more extreme than that. And the center of gravity has moved. And there is no reason to assume that that shift will stop because it's driven by very, very powerful factors, one of which is technology catch-up, um, rural areas in big economies in, in India, China, now increasingly in Africa, adapting to mobile telephony and productivity driving factors of that kind, and also demographics, which are a powerful underlying force too. So we're going to see that trend continuing and arguably accentuating and becoming increasingly focused on countries like Indonesia and Mexico and Nigeria and Turkey, which become really major economies. And sadly, you know, Britain starts from a weak position in relation to many of those countries for reasons we don't need to go into here. Um, exports were neglected for many years, combination of policy myopia <laughs> and uh, overvalued exchange rates. Um, people took their eye off the ball. I think they, they, these, we're now refocusing on it properly and getting leadership from the top. But it's a, a, a slow process and we start with very low penetration of many of those markets. I think we've also assumed until very recently that uh, we can compensate for that by attracting large amounts of FDI, foreign direct investment, into Europe, into the UK from those countries. And we've benefited enormously from having uh, some of the big Indian and Chinese companies investing here. But that may change because there will be competition for that capital from the big emerging markets elsewhere. And the, the other feature of the globalized economy is the way the, the, the value chains are fragmenting. And Sir Mark made the point that we are beginning to get onshoring um, in, in somewhat improbable areas like textiles, which I think we all thought had gone forever, but now seem to be coming back, as well as bits of the car industry and elsewhere. But, but, e but there is a reverse process that, that bits of the supply chain that have been taken for granted can easily migrate somewhere else. So it's a, it's a two-way two -way process. So um, more to manufacturing than just making things. Uh, the global context and the uh, emerging economies. I think thirdly, sustainable production. Um, you know, politicians may squabble about energy taxes in the UK, but it doesn't detract from the fact that a week, I think it was a week ago, fortnight ago, the IPPC published its latest report on climate change that was more definite and backed by a harder level of scientific consensus than we've had before and that is part of the reality. And we in the political class may find it inconvenient, but the truth is that this will massively affect the way uh, industry operates, because even if we don't act, cons consumers will react, um, investors will take a view about the long-term future of carbon intensive activities. Um, people in their recruitment will look for companies that are seen to be more forward-looking. So business will be unable to escape this, even if in the political world we find some of these choices difficult. So sustainability is an absolutely crucial dimension and increasing focus on uh, environmental sustainability. And then fourthly and finally, the way that skills are changing, uh, I think the traditional view of a skill being a skill for life, uh, and, and very narrowly defined, I think as this report makes clear, is, is changing out of all recognition. One of the things we're already beginning to realize that some of the most valuable people are people who combine engineering competence with a flair for design. 
uh, the, the kind of thing you see coming out of um, you know, Nissan's design unit Grand in Paddington or the Jaguar Land Rover in Gaydon. Uh, it's a product of that, the fusion of those skills. And what this report highlights and what a lot of companies tell us is that the really, really valuable people are people who do indeed, say in the aerospace industry, have a really good grasp of the technology around advanced uh, materials, but they're also able to manage global supply chains and the business uh, demands that that makes. The, the biotech industry, the people who have science, but also understand new production systems. And it's that complexity and rapid change in the pattern of skills that is difficult to predict, but is clearly crucial. Now, moving on to the implications for government, I think Sir Mark's made one point. Uh, we're dealing with statistical concepts that are often hopelessly out of date. Um, I saw a report a couple of days ago telling me that the ONS has recalculated the share of manufacturing in the economy. I, uh, downward, um, I, I, I began to wonder, I thought of this before, that probably the worst thing I ever did as an MP was vote for the independence of the Office of National Statistics. Uh, but nonetheless, they, they are politically independent. But we do need concepts that are a little bit more real uh, and do grasp in the way that this report does that manufacturing is more than simply production in an old-fashioned sense. So we do need uh, better metrics. I think that's key. The second conclusion that I have slightly more mixed feelings about is the idea of setting up an office of manufacturing. I'm not sure that this kind of machinery of government change helps. Actually, one of the good things about this government is we haven't changed the machinery of government. We've left it exactly as it is and tried to work within it and create some stability. That setting up offices either creates a separate bureaucracy or it's a bit of tokenism. So I'm sorry if I, I'm being a bit blunt. I, I, I sense this is a report, that this is a conclusion that might not get very far, but that's just my off-the-cuff reaction to it. But to be more positive on some of the things that government is doing that I think very much fit with the agenda of this report, um, I think the catapult system is one of the really good innovations we've made. Uh, we borrowed loosely, as many of you know, on the kind of Fraunhofer concept in Germany, getting, getting institutions that fit between the point of invention, uh, the ideas development in universities and elsewhere, and business application. And the chain of catapults, I think, is beginning to attract real interest and gather momentum. The first of them, as you know, was in advanced manufacturing, um, centered initially on Sheffield. Uh, but with um, developments on Teesside, particularly in the West Midlands, the Advanced uh, Manif the Materials Centre at Bristol and in Strathclyde. And the Advanced Manufacturing Catapults already uh, involve 600 businesses, I think a couple of thousand engagements with SMEs. It's attracting a significant amount of private capital. And I think we acknowledge that there's a lot more to, to build on what is already a success story after two to three years. Um, other things that were happening around the industrial strategy that I think fit very much with the agenda of this report. Uh, the very valuable work that's been done with the aerospace sector and the car industry, I think in the case of the aerospace sector, uh, I think re really massive, which is the agreement of the industry to put up a billion pound of its own capital matching what government's doing. Uh, to establish the Aerospace Technology Institute, the Automotive Advanced Propulsion Center, with slightly less money, but the same concept, to develop the next technology, next generation of engines. Um, and, and in a slightly broader and more upstream way, uh, government supporting some of the big new technologies that are coming through with practical applications like graphene. We think uh, quantum physics may be the next big area after graphene. Um, so, first of all, innovation and technology centres. Uh, secondly, skills. Um, the Perkins Review, I see the author sitting in the audience, uh, will appear next week on engineering skills, uh, identifying the scale of the problem and what we need to do about it. Various institutions designed to fill gaps in the financing system, the business bank, which is now up and running. Um, to, to wholesale, so you don't see it in the high street, but it will increasingly impact on financial flows. The Green Investment Bank that's already committed 800 million to green projects that wouldn't otherwise have got off the ground, co-financing the private sector. Um, the supply chain program for advanced manufacturing, 
the so-called Amsky scheme, uh, see inside manufacturing, trying to open the eyes of young people to the potential for careers in engineering. So a lot happening uh, around the broad framework of industrial strategy, and I think very much consistent with the themes of this report. So I, I uh, happy to take questions and participate in the discussion, but I just want to thank the authors for really good work. Uh, I think it fits very much with the message we're trying to give in government about the importance of industrial strategy, the importance of manufacturing, and the need to work with business. Thank you. Thank you very much, Secretary of State. Um, what we're now going to do is we're going to ask three of the members of the LEG to present cameos. Before they do that, can I just make a point that I think when some of you came in, you saw this and thought that was a report. That's the executive summary. The report is this document, which is about 200 pages, and in both you'll find reference to the 37 pieces of research we've commissioned, uh, which come out to about 2,000 pages. So, of course, what you're seeing today is the tip of that iceberg. So, Hamid, why don't you come forward and do your tip? Um, Hamid uh, from Rolls-Royce, uh, Dr. Hamid Magal, and, of course, one of the elements of the LEG who was able to base what we were saying into industrial experience, and in particular into an international flavour uh, with everything we were talking about. So, please uh, take us through. Good morning. As all of us know, I think technology plays a very important part in manufacturing today, but going forward, it will be increasingly important, probably be the primary source of global competitiveness and the value creation. The most compelling aspect for me is not that we'll have a wide range of amazing technologies at our disposal, but that these technologies will seamlessly integrate and create what I term as adaptable, knowledge-based manufacturing excellence. And I choose my words very, very carefully here. The adaptable manufacturing excellence environment will be very special. Many of the current norms, for example, inspection, quality assurance, and elements like these, they'll become redundant because you'll embed quality into the process, making it totally foolproof. The knowledge is in the process to self-correct itself. Number two, different concepts, for example, currently we have manufacturing engineering and design engineering. Again, these will become obsolete. You'll have systems engineering, people operating in master models, three-dimensional environments, virtual environments, creating new innovative designs. And the designs and the knowledge in the system will select the most appropriate manufacturing techniques and technologies and methods at the minimum total waste to the enterprise. I'm using the word waste again very carefully here because going forward, something of this nature, as my learned colleague will say later on, might become the common vocabulary, lowest waste to the total environment. Okay. So these capabilities will transform manufacturing in a number of ways. Some of these being been touched upon by Sir Mark. Um, mass personalization, low cost, very low cost products a more distributed local and a global production base, much, much, much closer to the customer, a digitized value chain. Real-time control, real-time flexibility, real-time adaptability. And much more interestingly, greater design freedom, collaborative design with customers and suppliers at the front end of the development, and collaborative designs with customers and suppliers. When you're making a product, you might have a core product, but the customer picks and chooses all the elements and the aspects unique to that individual customer. So the factories of the future will become something very special, highly capital intensive, producing complex one-off products, configurable processes, very, very configurable processes, adapting to the needs of the commodities, integrated with the changing value chains, but harnessing, and this is the important point, harnessing the knowledge of the skilled workers who are continuously creating and embedding new knowledge with that organization. Knowledge will be the determining factor in the future. 
And if you, if you compare factories today, there are people operating within factories and people designing the technologies and the systems and the methods. More people inside the factory, less people outside the factory. It, this will be reversed. More people designing knowledge, technologies, methods that then feed the systems that operate these wonderful new factories. And these factories could be in the urban areas because they'll be very friendly factories, friendly neighbors, because of all the things that technology will bring. So, going forward, a range of technologies will enable this transition to take place. The primary technology will become increasingly integrated with the high level systems, not just for the products themselves, but also the manufacturing elements. For example, the information and communication technologies will have a much wider role in the future manufacturing value, value chains. I mean the complete value chains. Integrating the operation, controlling, and making the flexibility happen when it's needed it's in real time to the needs of the customers and any supply chain disruption that might take place. Similarly, in new advanced materials, will not only enable greater functionality and performance of the products, but also make the manufacturing process itself easier to operate and foolproof. In my industry, for example, dual structure alloys, hybrid and tailored but extremely light assemblies and structures, intelligent materials designed to provide feedback to the primary systems all the time, continuously, self-healing materials, they'll become commonplace. And the development of the sensors will continue at a rapid pace. The but it's the integration of the centers into the network of technology that really is the exciting prospect for manufacturing, making manufacturing almost you know, autonomous, process self-diagnostics, fall-free manufacturing is the ultimate prize. However, to make much of this happen and to take advantage of this wonderful prospect going forward, we have to be quite realistic and we have to take account of this pipeline from very early research all the way to commercialization. The catapult, absolutely rightly, the, the Secretary of State highlighted that, have breached quite a lot of this gap, but there's something very unique about the way we approach technology in the UK. If we were by magic, just cluster all the technology development taking place here in the UK, for example, you might find there's a big cluster on the top right-hand corner. That's not sustainable going forward, because we have to earn to feed that. And therefore, there has to be a new kind of partnership <coughs> that we scale up this activity not only to feed this pipeline appropriately going forward with the technologies highlighted earlier, but more so to create a better balance across this pipeline. We have to create structures, mechanisms to make that happen. It won't happen just automatically because the tendency is for us to do a lot of good early research and then hope somebody will pick it up somewhere. No, we have to identify the route to market and we have to be a little bit more chauvinistic about natural interest going forward. So the future, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, is extremely exciting. It really is extremely exciting. And for once, and for once in my opinion, it plays to our strengths. But it's not going to come to us by itself. We have to grab it. Thank you. Okay, um, Hamid's followed by Professor Steve Evans. Those of you who know him will be surprised to see both a tie and the name Stephen on his badge today. So. I've got the microphone. You are in trouble. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. McGowan has offered us an exciting vision for what technology might be doing differently in the future, whether that technology is in the products that we manufacture or in the technology that we use in the manufacturing of those products but it's already been mentioned that that technology push is going to be happening alongside many other changes with strong implications on how manufacturing will respond. We have gathered data globally about what those greatest manufacturing drivers might be and it was rather interesting that across Europe, Asia and North America it was very clear that sustainability is seen as the single 
biggest driver of a change in behavior of manufacturing for some time to come. So I'm going to talk about that topic. Sustainability itself is a broad topic and a massive debate, which I hope to avoid. But it has specific impacts on manufacturing, some of which are listed here. The volatility of the price of resources has already been mentioned by Secretary, Secretary of State and Sir Mark. When we talk with companies, they are concerned about volatility of prices because that impacts on long-term decision making. But they're at least as concerned about the volatility of supply because without a material flowing into your factory, whatever decision you've made about the application of technology, you're not making very much money that day. And that's becoming an ever greater concern. People are designing supply chains with one eye on the vulnerability of that supply chain to things like extreme weather events, and that's going to increase. Companies are presuming over the next two or three decades an increasing use of regulation in different and varying forms to price the environment. And their decisions have to incorporate an ability to deal with those decisions. There is also a belief that consumer pull for what might be called eco products is going to increase and that the act of consumption itself is going to change. Uh, we've put quotes around it. I personally think it's a fairly ugly phrase, collaborative consumption. But we believe, and the evidence suggests, that people are going to be sharing versus owning some of their products, and that's the reference towards collaborative consumption. Different ways in which people access the technology that the great manufacturers are producing. We also expect to see a, a very significant increase in material reuse, product remanufacture, and material recycling, sometimes known as the circular economy. We've taken a lot of evidence, and we've considered how manufacturing might respond to these drivers. And these responses that are written up here are not just our reaction to the sustainability-related information that we've gathered, but to all of those 37 reports around the theme of response to sustainability as a driver. We've identified three major phases of response. The earliest phase is one that we're already in. Some of our lead companies, uh, I've seen Nissan in the room, Adnams, if you like beer, I promise a visit to the factory will show you excellence and be a very happy journey. Nissan have been doing an excellent job in ensuring that they're making significant improvements in the efficient use of energy, water, and materials in today's factory. It gives you the cost improvement, but it also makes you more resilient to those changes that you hope, when you become efficient, you sort of have that silent hope that it'll affect your competitors rather more than it'll affect you. This will become a competitive issue. We believe that this phase offers hope for UK products and for those UK technologies which can help the rest of the world's manufacturers make their own products more cleanly. And it implies a government role in supporting efficiency, not just leaving it to companies. The second phase we've characterized as a period of experimentation. This is, I believe this is really rather interesting. I've not observed this in other reports and evidence <coughs> elsewhere. And it coincides with many of the significant technology changes that Dr. McGall has been mentioning. When we integrate those sensors into our products, we're going to receive enormous quantities of data about how our customers are going to be using our products. And winning companies, winning manufacturers, are those people who are going to use that knowledge to the best advantage of the customer and themselves. And one of the ways in which they may use that knowledge is to help the customers reduce their own exposure to energy, water, and material prices and, volati and volatility, uh, volatility of supply.
wouldn't it be nice, and um, we've already observed some companies experimenting with new business models where the manufacturing supplier pays the energy bill of their products being used in somebody else's factory. That directly incentivizes them to think about the long term and to put technology into those products and to put sensors in and get that information back. We see people telling their customers that they're using the technology poorly and that they could be better off using it in a different way. That's not forcing it upon the customer, but it's giving good information and it's hopefully going to mean that those companies are going to win repeat contracts by directly helping their customer. We believe that these experimental business models are going to help companies who, as Hamid has mentioned, have the knowledge to extract the maximum value and to create the minimum waste around their manufactured products. Manufacturers who will succeed during this period are already experimenting with these new forms of value. And I'm going to put Marks and Spencers up there as a type of manufacturer. And we've seen their swapping business model, which has very strong implications for manufacturing. But we also see companies like Rolls-Royce, like Rockwell, and like Vitsu in the UK, experimenting with their business models. We believe the winners are going to be the companies who can use their knowledge to deliver maximum value and minimum waste. And such a period of experimentation, it's difficult to predict what business models are going to emerge as the best, but it implies a government role in supporting experimentation and innovation in developing new business models. In the final third phase, we'll be able to use all that latest technology that's been mentioned and change the scale logic of manufacturing. For hundreds of years, we've been trying to make ever more stuff going through ever fewer machines. That will become more and more blurred, and it will become blurring as to what it means to be a manufacturer. We are going to see more manufacturing technology happening on the farm, or in the retailer, or in the hospital, or in the home. That needs organizing and orchestrating, and we believe manufacturers are the people who will ensure quality and safety and efficiency of those systems. This final phase brings an emphasis on the government to use its convening power to bring actors together. We've seen one good example in my subject area, the court old commitment organized by RAP, bringing together private and public in an effective way. Some of you may have seen a diagram of this sort before, and we expect manufacturers to organize their supply chains so that the value they've put into the molecules and compounds they supply will be returned to them physically. Manufacturers know best how to extract the value from those molecules and compounds, so they want them back. JCB and Caterpillar have already been mentioned as operating this business model to when you go there, it's quite a fantastic scale. When you look at it on a national scale, it's the tip of the iceberg, and we believe that this type of system will increasingly occur over the next decades. Some people call this the circular economy, but it forms part of a larger system change. We believe that we're going to be growing more of our products rather than subtractive manufacturing whether that be through bio biotechnology or additive manufacturing or other technologies that are going to help us. We'll be able to use local materials and we'll be able to economically manufacture at a small scale. So I'm going to end with a little picture. By 2050, factories are going to be able to use their highly skilled people to organize money, machines and materials in revolutionary ways. That implies that the water and air leaving the factory is cleaner than the water and air going in. That factory will, will be able to make a variety of products closer to the customer, closer to their needs, using local materials. I think the implication of that is that such factories will be so attractive that people will petition to have them at the end of their streets. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Steve. Um, Professor Alan Hughes, who will now move us from the technical discussion to the implications for, for policy. Well, I'm going to really address three, three key points uh, in these three slides. The first is that the kind of changes that we've been hearing about are going to require a much more integrated view of the way we choose to measure what our economy is doing and what we call manufacturing. Secondly, that we'll need a great deal more detailed information about the way value is created in different sectors, what kind of technologies can develop and how they can be exploited in different sectors, and that's going to require a lot more detailed information to have effectively targeted policy. And then thirdly, what all this implies for the way in which policy is developed, implemented, and carried through. And in thinking about the latter in particular, we spend a lot of time looking at current policy developments in this area in multiple countries. And it's very important to realize that although the UK has a particular challenge, there are a set of generic policy issues with all economies are facing, which is understanding manufacturing, and in particular, how do you develop a sufficiently long-term policy and framework which will be able to deal with the evolution of policy beyond political cycles. And the suggestions we make are based on a very careful assessment of what other major competitors are doing in this area and trying to locate it in the UK system. Well, when I was asked to make this presentation, say, could I make a big plea for metrics, I thought standing up and giving a talk on how vital statistics are was one of the greater challenges I faced. But then I looked back at where the origin of the word statistics comes from. And it comes from the German word statistics, which is connected with the desire to actually understand the, uh, the state. So it's very important that we recognize that our statistics, our metrics, must evolve with our changing state. And in the case of manufacturing, we have to understand what is an increasingly complex process and the way in which we design our statistical collection, our metrics, has to reflect that. So in this, in this slide here, you can see all the various stages which have very eloquently been described in the previous two presentations about how the value which is extracted from manufacturing is increasingly involving integrations across lots of different stages. If we insist on trying to measure what we call manufacturing by focusing on the little green box in the middle, then we're going to miss out a critically important part of the story of how value is created from manufacturing and what we need to do um, to make our manufacturing sector more competitive. And so what we propose in the, in the report, and again this is a problem which many statistical agencies are facing, we'll find the same debate in the US, in Germany and elsewhere, is to think carefully through how we collect the data and how we capture both the interconnections between what we call fabrication and all of these other, or production, all of these other stages, and secondly, when we measure an activity at a particular place, when we go to one of Steve's uh, desirable factories at the corner of the street, we want to know what exactly is being done there where there's more integration between, say, design uh, and, and fabrication than one, one might expect. So one specific proposal then is that there should be some experimentation with the way in which this data is collected to make it more fit for purpose in a world that's going to stretch out to um, 2050. The second thing is when one has a, a great deal of information that might be collected by the government, one has to realize that the depth of information and knowledge about technology, about appropriating value, and about competitiveness is very dispersed. And it's embedded in a wide range of sources of knowledge, not just universities, but the businesses themselves. And the way in which one develops a particular business model and targets policy has to be able to root itself in a very clear understanding of what are very varied sectors in terms of their requirements and also has to root itself in the knowledge that many technologies that we observe don't have immediately identifiable routes to market in a single sector but may span many sectors in advanced materials, uh, digitally driven changes. It's very difficult to see where ultimately the value will be created. So you have to think very carefully on a very good knowledge base about what the nature of sectoral developments are and you also have to have the ability to track unexpected routes down which emerging technologies will follow. And that means policy needs to be able to identify in a rather granular, specific way the kind of barriers that might prevent the emergence of value and the capture of value for the UK in these different sectors. And the third thing is, uh, again as uh, Dr. McGill had in his slide showing this complex path from, from science to commercialization, 
you have to think through policy from a systems point of view in which you recognize that the trajectory in any technology or sector will involve interactions with many different government departments and having an integration across what we might now call science policy, technology policy or innovation policy into what now might be called industrial policy involves thinking across each of those domains and that requires some way of spanning different department, different departments and different policy developments. Now the, these two things in turn involve uh, investment and innovation in policy delivery. And so the, the third point that we want to emphasize in this report, again taking a long-term perspective and thinking deeply about the kind of experimentation that other countries are doing in this area, is that there will be a really greater requirement on the ability of government to access this very wide range of intelligence and information which are going to affect the effectiveness of its policy. And it needs to be able to evaluate changes across the sector in a highly informed way, recognizing the variations across sectors and technologies and the differences between them. And also has to have a very deeply rooted ability to assess changes. And in particular, what we want to emphasize is that many of these changes in new technologies will be a process of discovery and support has to have both a deep embeddedness in knowledge of the sectors, but it also has to have the ability to invest more when things turn out to be going well, but also retreat and stop investing when things are going bad. And that policy has to recognize there will be honorable dead ends in a very uncertain technologically driven world. Thirdly, um, one of the great things which emerged from our international comparisons and from our consultations, and I think was very much echoed in the Secretary of State's comment at the beginning is, we need to find mechanisms for making policy long-term and sustainable so that the policy environment matches the long-term investment and other objectives of the businesses themselves. And we've suggested a number of options which we really hope will be given detailed and careful consideration, one of which is captured by the idea of creating an office of manufacturing. And it must absolutely be true that creating a name without resources and without embedding it in a clear overall structure of government would indeed be a futile exercise. But the idea of thinking carefully about how, as we have done with infrastructure, or another, a number of other examples that we found where you have an overarching integrated function that can potentially think beyond the political life cycle is a very important part of devising forward-looking policy. So whether this takes the form of an office of manufacturing or some other policy innovation um, recommendation in this area, we must think long-term about how we can have innovation in the delivery of government policy to assist a long-term view of how policy can develop to 2050. Okay, well, thank you, Alan. We're, we're going to move into um, Q&A. Two things before we do. First of all, on the metrics point, uh, interestingly, when we were discussing it with Sun, they thought we were talking about changing the metrics to make manufacturing look bigger, as if somehow we're a champion for manufacturing. We're not. We're a champion for understanding what on earth it is we're trying to do. And, for example, we keep emphasising the importance of manufacturing and exports, but the interesting question is, would it have the same importance if we looked at the added value contribution to the UK as opposed to just the gross output? It's an illustration of how there's very few single issue discussions we can have here. On Q&A, what I'd like to before asking the first question, can I ask the five members of the LEG that you've not met to just stand so that you can see the faces behind the balance of the, the names you've got on the back page of your report? And to introduce them as you see them from I start with the lady, it's easier than you know. So we've got Alan Green, Alan Green, Alan Green, Richard Harris, Chris Lowe, sorry, <laughs> got Michael Sterling, Richard Harris. We've got uh, Nick Cross, sorry, I was looking at you from the back. You can see who they are. Um, what I'm going to do, thank you very much, everybody. Sit down, I didn't get that well. I'll have the backs, names on the backs next time, like football shirts. And what we're going to do is with the questions, um, apart from if they're addressed specifically to the platform, is I'm going to ask various members of the LEG if they would be prepared to take the mic and address your questions so you're getting a broader view in addition to the three presentations you've had this morning. Mark? Can I just say that the Secretary of State has to slip out, so I just wonder if we could give him the opportunity to say any final words on, on the course, way out. Just 
Uh, well, I think something I should have said about the platform, uh, the, the government's formal response to all this will be forthcoming. We have a process in government, um, and indeed some of the things which you obviously feel strongly about, the Office of Manufacturing, we'll, we'll obviously give thought to that. Uh, I was wrapping rather off the cuff to it. Um, uh, but, yeah, I just, just once again, I think rather than you know, reinventing a lot of controversies, just thank you very much for what you've done. Um, I think a lot of people in the room have contributed massively to the idea of the industrial strategy, and we continue to work with you. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, so can I have first question? Gentlemen, have we got a microphone which we're handing out? Gentlemen, over here. Hi. Working? Yeah. Hi. Uh, Will Stewart, um, Tuck University, IET, various other places. I'm really a communications, global communications person, but I'm also on the board of the Nottingham Advanced Manufacturing Centre that does 3D printing. And two nights ago, I was with David Willits at the Science Museum talking about the links between design and engineering. And that was actually fascinating. You know that Brit designed this. You know that processes and this are designed by ARM, which is something you've already mentioned. But, and I discovered that Sebastian Conrad is a well-known designer who actually has qualifications in metallurgical physics. But actually, if you talk to the people there, very few designers have engineering qualifications and vice versa. That cross-disciplinary skill set is really missing in the UK. And I wonder what we can all do, including <coughs> with the minister who's gone and David Willett, who was there listening, can do to try and enhance this, because that seems to be a really big win for British manufacturing. Okay, let's take that in three phases, if I, if I can. Chris, would you like to respond to that joining up for it first? So let me do my best, Chairman. Um, well, we, we have a number of issues which we're looking at at the moment. One is the combined skills of bioscientists with, um, uh, with um, commercial skills. So we run a course in masters of that. We get very good candidates for that, about 600 uh, applications for 25 places. So that, that's one aspect of that. Uh, there are also links already between art schools and scientists as well. Again, we have personally have a link with the uh, University of Arts in London, uh, designing various bits. So we're using their designers with our skills in science and technology. But to add to what you just said, I would say this is very crucial for the future, and it's how you actually achieve that with the British system being what it is. You need the research councils involved so they can see cross-disciplinary. You need the, the individuals to be actually rewarded for that. At the moment, the system based on this nature tend to be very much in silos, but we're going to be talking about a lack of interaction. And this applies not just to the dairy use it, but to, I say, the business versus the science and technology as well. So we need to consider the lack of interactions. How did you add anything to that? Are you happy? Okay, thank you. Gentleman in the second row. Microphone over there. Oh, microphone over there. Let's just get one microphone to one of the two. <laughs> Can we come in? Where is it, the mic? Because the microphone is Yes, I'm John Martin. I'm responsible for putting this on the road. Um, I have two points. One is the last one that was raised. I think the issue of the lady engineering, you know, science skills to, to not design, it's not the business. I think education we've been so far, but it's not the business. We have a pretty big silent center in Paddington, uh, which is referred to by the Secretary of State. But uh, basically it's out to me to make sure that stylists and designers don't give them shape so they can't manufacture it. So industry has to take care of that type of issue. And it brings me to my question. At a meeting I had with Mr. Willis, I was very strong in the sense that the discussion about skills has to be brought back to a very simple point. The job of the state is to give me well-rounded, well-educated young people. It's my job to develop their skills for my particular position. The educational substructure cannot do that. That's very simple. So I think we've got to get away from this dependency-based attitude that the government has to do everything for the industry. We have to provide the skills. They give us well-rounded citizens with a good degree of education. It's up to us to convert them into skilled workers. However, my point is, do you think we need to develop a similar policy document on education? Education is a convenient political problem. 
Mark and then Anne. There have been endless policy documents on education, and there's a lot happening, I think. Anne, would you like to respond to the point on skills? <laughs> Yes, I think um, just on, on the point about uh, that was made about employers, we do make a point in our big report about the employer ownership of skills agenda, which is absolutely crucial. But we also um, talk about uh, young people coming through the education system and talk about the potential going forward and building on what's done already with uh, employers going into schools and right through the system, right from when kids are very enthusiastic through to the teenage stage and right through universities. So making that ongoing, it's not just a one for all thing and you, you've captured somebody's interest at one stage. Sure. What we find is that you need to keep going on all through so that you, you keep it up as people get older. So that's the point I wanted to make in response to that question. Thank you. I mean, in a way, your question about education is, I suppose, something we've been trying to address overall, which is we think single subjects don't work here. In other words, just looking at education. Um, a phrase you could almost use is that industry is the client of all the other departments in, in government. It needs a workforce, it needs healthy people, it needs proper infrastructure, transport, energy, you name it. And, I, and the point that, that, that Alan was starting with, and which we've been absolutely clear about in this report, is single issue approach will not work. You've got to understand the systemic approach and if we could just forget we're British and we don't do things like that around here and observe what all the other countries are doing, we might actually leap forward a bit. Um, next question. A oh, gentleman over the corner. Uh, Michael Kelly, University of Cambridge. Um, coming back to this issue of the formation, one thing that the engineering institutions in this country could do would be to take a leaf out of the American institutions. The IEEE in the United States requires as part of the formation of engineers that get accredited that 20% of the credits are taken from outside the engineering factory. In this country, uh, we struggle to get 5% allowance to do anything. So I think if we could treble that so that, you, well, from my close observation of MIT during the CMI project, I saw musicians coming into the physics department and physicists going into the Sloan School and so on and so forth in order to get the, the extra degree of roundness on the edge. And I think of the engineering institutions could take a real lead on that. The second question I wanted to ask, uh, and again I'll hop back to the CMI project, which lasted from 2000 to 2006, linking Cambridge to MIT. There were a number of pointers left behind where a, a, another report is due about now for what happened, because three years after it finished there was a report to show the implications. It's probably time now seven years after and I, to say, well, what happened with that $100 million investment? So my question for today is, what would be the metrics in 2025 that we would look back on and see what the impact of this report has been? Um, 2025 is probably long enough out to, uh, to put up one of those graphs we had earlier and said we stopped the relative decline at least, folks. That's base one. Because, of course, the stats in terms of our performance are... You have, to be, you have to look forward to being encouraging, and that's what we are. But looking back, it's pretty dismal. We've de-industrialised faster, our stats relative to other people, our rate of converting innovation into patents is, is awful, and therefore there are a whole series of things which we could say, look back and be grim. And it'd be lovely in 2025 to look down and see some of those, particularly the, uh, the pre-production -pre drivers, having improved. Because actually that's probably not a bad outcome, bearing in mind we're aiming for 2050. What we don't want to do is to find we're at 2025 and actually none of this has been listened to, none of it's been read. We've carried on as we have done and our system just will continue to fail us because there's imbalance between the planning cycles of the political system and the industrial system. Can I suggest then that that particular point is embedded in the system so that in 10 years' time there is another report? Thank you for the proposal. I'd, I'd almost wish there could be more regular. In, in a way, sorry, I apologise, I'm doing the answer at the moment. Not the experts are supposed to do that, not the chairman. Um, one of the things you might like for the, the manufacturing cross-sector group to do is to sort of take ownership of this and to at least test initiatives going out into the future for consistency against what's in here because 
nothing we've said, nothing we're allowed to say, is not evidence-based, as opposed to it being opinionated. So that's quite a good base to use as your framework. And a company with this would, would love to have a 20-year framework like that, because more thought's gone into that, I, I confess, than I've ever put into a company strategy. Uh, you know, what an admission. But I haven't spent two years just on strategy on one system before. Alan, you wanted to add? Well, just to say that, that one of the arguments for having an office of manufacturing type organisation is precisely to hold a reflective mirror periodically to what they're actually having, the underlying trends in the system, and where policies have been introduced, what kind of knowledge have we got about whether they're working. So it wouldn't be so much a discrete 10 year review, it would be a kind of rolling assessment that could be carried out independent of the departments. Hi, yeah, I've just got a question about the evidence base of some of the technologies that we um, uh, been mentioned as being of drivers. So, for example, um, 3D printing at home um, and uh, mass customization. I remember getting very excited about mass customization in the 80s with a uh, debate around post orgasm and uh, there's various vivid visions um, cast around there. I've been tracking it and it's been fairly, over the last 20, 30 years, it's been fairly modest developments there. Also, 3D printing at home, I, I chair a, an annual conference uh, for product designers and, and engineers and we've had multiple discussions about 3D printing and no, uh, none of those debates has anyone seriously um, put a strong case forward for 3D printing at home being. Okay, let me respond and I'll ask one of my, the experts to come in. If you go and doing a study of the future manufacturing, you have to talk about the technologies of manufacturing. A simpler report might have read, this is, these are some of the options that may surround this industry going out to 2050. What this report about is about is making sure that those who want to participate are prepared, are flexible, are skilled up, are adaptable, such that whatever the actual shape and what, act, what actually the emphasis of the fashion is, we can adopt it instead of saying, oh, sod it. I mean, somebody mentioned earlier the technology. British Aerospace sold the LCD technology for 100,000 to the Koreans because no one in the UK wanted it. Would you believe it? I mean, years and years and years back, Dick. Neither you or I blame off of that. Um, but because that came out of the simulation stuff around the Eurofighter, uh, as, I'm, as I understand it. So uh, the key thing, therefore, is not to get too hat up by the emphases we're putting, because what you will have noticed in those presentations, actually, was behavior aspects around, if you like, the, the physical options. And it's those behavior aspects we need to change. But a response to the comment, Hamid? I've been manufacturing uh, 28 odd years now, working for a number of companies. I never would have thought that about 10 years ago, exactly the way you commented upon. And I remember people talking about factories with lights out in the 80s and 90s. But I've seen a different world of manufacturing in the last 7, 8 years. It is as global as football. Good manufacturing, competent manufacturing is as global as football is. You go to far corners of the world, and you find intensity in manufacturing for all the reasons that Richard and everybody else have described today, at a level we've never ever seen before. <coughs> Concurrent developments, information technology, communication, computers, intelligent computing, sensors, materials. You know, it's almost like what happened to computers, a very slow, big, very large IBM mainframe, then suddenly it accelerated. You will see exactly that happening to manufacturing. 3D printing, stuff like that, transform value chains. So what we're proposing in the report, my personal and professional judgment, living in manufacturing for so many years, is very, very realistic. It might come faster than what we are proposing. You may have a different world of manufacturing in 15 to 20 years, may not be 35 to 35 years, it could be much earlier. It is very real. Okay, Gentlemen on the yeah. I'm Martin Hay from the uh, Shell Scenarios team, so it's a shame that Vince has uh, gone, but um, we're still looking at the very long term, so he'll be reassured in that. Um, I was very interested in Professor Steve Evans's comments about the 
context in which all of this might be taking place. And I can see, you know, fully sign up to the idea that the sustainability agenda is going to rise up the uh, political priorities, industry priorities, uh, and you know, manufacturers are going to have to sort of respond to that and lead it. But I wondered whether some of the conclusions that he drew were quite as definite as I would sort of potentially see them. I can see how a world of rising volatility that he talks about might mean that we need more spare capacity and we need maybe more stocks in the system. But I wasn't quite so sure that it would mean that we inevitably have everything done more local. You know, we've had a lot and the scale would necessarily shrink. You know, there's been a lot of, I just wonder if it's more of a mixed pattern. And I guess my point here is whether the context in which we're thinking about strategies for manufacturing in the UK needs to think about different worlds. And we see a lot of processes of sort of globalisation that Hamid was just talking about there that don't necessarily mean that manufacturing is done locally. So much is done more and more globally, and scale is actually still a huge advantage in many sectors and many industries, not in, the, not in the whole economy, but in many. And we might need to think about those where scale, economies of scale and globalised manufacturing is still going to be a big feature and those where it's not. Yeah, Richard, would you like to talk about globalisation and then we'll hand over to Steve to answer this specific point? Okay. Well, um, actually, it should be Hamid to actually respond to that. But what, what, what I would say is that, um, uh, to some extent, I do agree. There, are, it, it's a, there, there isn't a one-size-fits-all. I think there is uh, evidence that shows that um, manufacturing technologies and customization of manufacturing processes are going to result in more ability for local responses and use of, of local materials and the importance of keeping uh, what uh, is, is tend to come to be known as the industrial commons, the, 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 um, the, the whole scenario of pre and post the fabrication process taking place in local economies, plus uh, the kind of policy that's been followed. But equally on the other hand, evidence that we uh, were given was very, very clear in the continued future uh, globalization of the manufacturing um, uh, process within the overall value chain. So the ability to control that global value chain is seen to be an extremely important and strong competitive advantage to companies. But then you've got that dichotomy between large multinational companies controlling the global trade and smaller manufacturing companies providing for local markets for customization in local. So, that, so both are happening together. I wouldn't want to say it's one or the other. Both things, in my view, but I don't think one would go. Well, I'm, I'm going to apologise. I think that um, it's not inevitable that it's going to go on the local scale. If it was inevitable, I wouldn't have put it in the report. I'd have gone to my stockbroker. <laughs> but the scale logic is already changing. It's going to change at different rates for different sectors and different technologies. For some that we currently see as very high scale uh, manufacturing operations, for example, steel. Steel went through that revolution in the 1970s with mini mills. It's already happened. Who's to say it's not going to happen again, even in steel, where scale is incredibly important? The evidence suggests that, therefore, scale logic is going to change at different speeds for different sectors. And we can't do the one-size-fits-all thinking, which we used to do, because in the past, scale logic was always in one direction for all sectors. Thank you. Thank you. very often from commentators and cultural critics and so on is that we've all got too much stuff, we're all consuming too much, um, we don't need all the stuff that we've got, and that stuff doesn't make you happy. It's called affluenza and so on. Um, I don't agree with any of that, but I put it to you that, because uh, I have a lot of stuff myself, but uh, <laughs> I am uh, I mean, more serious than poor people, even in this country, but alone in the developing world, don't have a lot of stuff. But I put it to you that the, our intelligence here in this country is 
likely under the banner of sustainability to be quite hostile to manufacturing and engineering for creating more staff. We can reply if we follow this report that we are minimizing waste and so on. But my question is this, how in this rather anti-manufacturing atmosphere where play and uh, electrons are more highly valued than physical objects, how can we raise the status and not least something that hasn't been discussed this morning, the pay of people in manufacturing. Mine is not the traditional wage that um, you know, nobody, nobody understands us engineers and you know, we're regarded as oily rags and please can we have a bit more salary and so on. I think there is something new out there today which are, um, is detectable in the atmosphere, which is a broad hostility to uh, the world of making things. How can we change the argument and also laugh all the way to the bank? <laughs> I think the right way to start the answer is actually to say economic growth really matters. And we've just actually lived through five years without any growth and I think we're starting to see uh, the downsides of that. It matters perhaps because it delivers more material things, but it also matters because it delivers the things which improve the quality of life more generally. Uh, if we're in favour of better technology, and I think most people in this room would be, Better technology has been central, for example, over the last hundred years to massively increasing our life expectancy. There's a huge gain in welfare there. So I think I would be putting the issue, we would on the whole like more economic growth, we would like sensible growth, we would like growth which improves living standards rather than in a narrow sense only delivers stuff. But if we then ask ourselves where does growth come from, it comes from improving productivity. And improving productivity is, if you like, the holy grail of more growth. Where does improving productivity come from? Well, in the sense of this report, it comes from the value chains in which manufacturing is an integral part. It seems to me that's a reasonably easy sell to most intelligent people. I can't speak for the intelligentsia because I don't know quite who those are. But they sound like people who wouldn't be welcome in this room. <laughs> I'll take, what I'm going to do, we're approaching half 11, I'll take, uh, Steve, do you want to come in with an ad and I'll take a last question from the back. Uh, you make a good point, but it's clear from the evidence that we've taken that we're moving away from a conversation about consumption to a conversation about value. So manufacturers are delivering value and the terms value and waste are seen as more important. If we can give you more value, more joy, more health, and dematerialize and reduce the energy and water needed to deliver that value, then we're just doing our normal, good, productivity job that we would do as sensible manufacturers. And that's the trend that we're perceiving. So it's not a consumption of stuff, it's a consumption of value that will be changing the shape of manufacturing's response. I hope everyone's happy. I, I like buying stuff. And then last question. Oh, I'm, I'm Stephen uh, I'm the author of the paper on uh, an aging society of manufacturing in, in your, your school. So I'm going to do just a little bit of lobbying here, if I can. Because I think, glancing at the summary of the report, it seems to me there is a remarkably little about the people in this system. Uh, there is a section about skills. It doesn't say very much about the numbers. Now, the UK Commission on Employment and Skills last estimate was that over the next 10 years, we're going to need about 13 and a half million jobs filled in order to replace, mainly, people retiring. And there are only 7 million people in the school system. Now, if Nissan takes all of those, because they come out well-rounded, well-educated people, and they're employable by Nissan, there are not going to be any, not any people left to do the job, the jobs that are required. We've got a shortfall of maybe five million people needed in the workforce as a whole, and manufacturing is competing with lots of others. It seems to me it's really important to think hard about the implications of that, about how we retain and continue to develop the skills of people, particularly retain people later. And the really stunning figure that I came across when we were doing that report was 40% of the nuclear workforce will retire in the next 10 years. Um, but we are about to perhaps renew Trident. We've just launched a new nuclear power station building program. Where are the people going to come from? How long does it try to take to train 
a nuclear world, let alone a nuclear and professional engineer. We really do, I suspect, have to take that issue more seriously. Okay, I'll, I'll just get two answers back to you. Michael, do you want to comment on the nuclear point? Yes, the nuclear point is, is a well-made point. We, we've had recognised that problem for a number of years, but the confidence of students wanting to read nuclear engineering at undergraduate level or postgraduate level is the key. Not until they realise that there is an opportunity for a job as a graduate does actually that demand change. Now, we are seeing change. I used to be BC at uh, Birmingham, and we had a postgraduate course in nuclear engineering where the demand was directly coupled, and it's, the graph is in the report, directly coupled to the government statements about the future of nuclear. The numbers jumped up as soon as there was a, as a positive statement and held constant when there was nothing said. So there is a, a, a level of confidence. The other skills, the point about numbers, I agree with entirely. I mean, if we, we produce around about 21,000 engineering technology graduates per year, 21,000. The numbers that you see in the report about the demand for those graduates is overwhelming compared to that production. So that those, most of those are not, only really about 25% of them will be in manufacturing related areas. So that the numbers that we're producing annually is tiny. And that has got to change. And it's the skills that will be made the report in the, the point in the report very strongly. A greater, higher skills level of graduates coming out is needed for the manufacturing industry. But the quality of those, of course, is not an absolute. It's a, it's a relative one. So we want to produce graduates who are every bit as good as our competitors, and preferably better, because at that point, we should be able to produce better products. So it's a, the resources that need to be put into that are significant. And I've droned on for many years about you get what you pay for, essentially, in producing, in producing engineering uh, undergraduates into graduates. It costs you more to produce better graduates. Unless we recognize that and do something about it, we won't really have to look into Thank you. And do you want to comment on the general point on the issue? Yes. Yes, thank you very much. I think the um, point you make is, is well made. And I'd also flag up again to people that there is that report, evidence report on ageing and the implications of that for both the supply side and the demand side that is now available on the web. As regards the point made going forward, we do in the main report um, talk about the issue of the need going forward to, to make, to utilise the skills of older people, older, older workers, to ensure that there's also ways into manufacturing for people who've perhaps made left other sectors but bring other skill sets, the generic skills that may be useful in manufacturing. So we do make those points. And um, finally, and I won't go into this, we also <coughs> talk about human enhancement, but I think, as we said at the start, that's off the agenda, and I'm not really that keen on some of the implications of that. So thank you. Okay, um, just to, to close, a couple of points I'd like to make. Um, for me as a businessman, it's been fascinating working with a faculty of this quality for two years. Um, and the stimulation that you get from mixing practical experience with academic thinking, where both sides learn from each other, it's a fabulous process. This report isn't going to be any good to any of you if you skim it. Uh, if I were leading a company, I would have my strategy director read it cover to cover and tell me what's in it that's of interest. If I'm an academic, I'm going to ask someone to read it and tell me how does that compare with the sorts of things we're thinking about. Because we need you to read it, we need you to reflect upon it, and if you feel comfortable with the directions it's setting out and some ideas, we want you to promulgate it. Because this is all about, this has not been about, you know, a headline article in the newspaper this morning. In a way, it's almost too important for that because we don't want an instant response. We want people to read it, think about it, and then let's coalesce into going in the right direction together. Thank you very much indeed for coming this morning.